The only thing about a first impression you got to worry about is that you make a bad first impression because then that becomes your last impression because the inside is so fed up with you, you don't want to talk anymore. That's Chris Voss, former FBI hostage negotiator, CEO of the Black Swan Group, and the best-selling author of Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as if Your Life Depended on. You can get away with a mediocre first impression. The other side's going to give you some rope. You can't get away with bad first impression. And then immediately, whatever the last impression is, it colors the rest of the interaction. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Chris Voss to discuss why we should be skeptical of quote unquote win-win opportunities, the transformative power of a collaborative mindset, and the dangers of complacency. Negotiation is a perishable skill. There's no way around it. Simply doing it is not enough to stay good at it. Now, unfortunately, the only time you really question whether or not you got the best system is when you lose or you lose bad. And of course, that's a problem with winning. You don't put that sort of introspective on, on the win. When you should, but you don't. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Before we begin today's episode, I want to remind you that we aren't beholden to any sponsors or run any ads on this podcast. This allows us to present all of our episodes raw and unfiltered. I'm not going to push any made-to-order meal services on you or try to save you any money on your car insurance. That being said, I have one small request. If you receive any value from this podcast, please give it a five-star review. Pay the fee so we can keep this podcast free. Chris, welcome back to the podcast, sir. Michael, it's my pleasure. I know we were talking about this just before we started recording, but the the last time you were on the podcast was episode five of the podcast back in March of 2020. It was roughly around the time, maybe a week before the pandemic hit. And it was obviously a very tumultuous time. Now we've made it through all that. Fast forward several years. What what have been some of the most significant developments or projects that you've been involved with since March of 2020, right? Since the pandemic. Well, there's a documentary film that did with Nick Nat and DNA Films. We got that in the can. It was finished a little over a year ago. Probably going to get a distribution deal on that sometime by the middle of this year. Looking forward to that thing getting out. Nick Nan, great guy. He gets stuff done. So, you know, Nick comes with an idea and I'm like, okay. Because, you know, as you know, a great idea is our dime a dozen. I, you know... But paraphrasing Buffett, an idiot with a plan beats a genius with a great idea. And then, of course, you got to know the landscape, otherwise your plan isn't any good. But Nick understands landscape and plans. So when he's got an idea, I just go like, okay, because I know he's already got a plan mapped out in his head and he's got an idea of the landscape. So we did the documentary. You know, there's a, a book that just came out, which is a collaboration among me and 30 other authors on empathy. And then, so then he comes with me with an idea. Uh, he's like, hey, let's create a bourbon dedicated to business only, the only business bourbon in the world from deal making. And we'll call it the difference. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> so we're working on that this year too. It's cool. I love it. I love it. And then that also, for anyone that takes the Delta flight, you're on every plane, on every flight. So has that been, I mean, I imagine you've had people reach out to you saying, hey, Chris, man, I'm on this flight right now and I'm watching you. Has that happened at least once? Uh, it, it ha- it's, it's happening more and more now, you know. Happy it's on Delta because it happens to be my, my favorite airline. They screw up the least, so I'm on Delta every chance I get. Uh, it hasn't happened yet where the person sitting next to me has dialed it up. I'm looking forward to that moment. Yep. But uh, yeah, I get called on a regular basis that the first time I saw the master class was on Delta and then they binge watched it. And I'm like, awesome. 
because you know, what are you going to do when you're on the airplane? Your Wi-Fi is probably not going to work. You might as well watch something that can feed your mind. And selfishly, feed your mind with negotiation stuff. I want to ask you a little bit about the, the latest book, the collaboration you did with Nick and, and several other authors, The Empathy and Understanding in Business. And I love how you open it up uh, with the example of Harvey Specter from Suits. And you know, given that our audience is predominantly attorneys, can you speak to the, the distinction between say negotiating and what that looks like on TV versus what effective negotiation looks like in real life. Yeah, they, they look vastly different. What's portrayed to us in the media and on TV most of the time, slam dunk negotiations where you crush the other side. And I liken that it's very much like playing the slots at Vegas. Like you celebrate the wins so much and you forget that the algorithm for slots in Vegas is a win one in every 84 tries. But they get you to celebrate the win so much, you don't pay any attention to how often you lose. A victory one in every 84 tries, you, that's not a sustainable, it's barely sustainable. Like you're probably at best, at best, a C student because you want a big victory. And great negotiation is astonishing. Uh, another project we got going uh, we got to deal with Mark Wahlberg's company on realistic ideas. I'm not talking to Mark. I don't need to talk to Mark. I need to talk to the people who work for him to get stuff done. I haven't met him. Uh, at some point in time, we'll cross paths and say, hey, how are you? And that'll be it. But I'm working with his people on developing this non, uh, non-scripted show. And I said, you got to understand, this is not going to be real housewives. This isn't going to be Hell's Kitchen. It's not going to be Bar Rescue. Nobody's going to be yelling at anybody because great negotiation isn't exciting. It's astonishing. Because suddenly at some point in time, you're going to be astonished that you're making a great deal. Like you're not going to know how you got from being adversarial to collaborative and the other side's telling you stuff they shouldn't tell you, but they do. And it's astonishing. And in the legal world, in the real world, the, the real world, legal world, way back when, just before I left the FBI, young man came through and he was a White House fellow and he got detailed to the FBI And he got detailed to my unit and they gave him to me as an intern because they knew I'd put him to work. I was famous for putting people to work. And uh, through serendipity, he kind of got the shaft in becoming an FBI agent. He got somebody that was overly critical of his attempts to get in. And the first time when he should have got in, they rejected him physically, even though he was in phenomenal condition. And they said, you got to come back and try this again. In the interim, when he was going back to train, he was a law school graduate and a law firm in his hometown contacted him. And he's, he said to and his bride said, you know, maybe it's a sign for the universe. Yep, yeah, it's not for me. I'll go become a practicing attorney. But he'd gotten really exposed to collaborative negotiation. He saw me do it as a hostage negotiator. I took him with me as I was negotiating a couple kidnappings and he watched me do it. He's got some good stories from some stuff I put him through. <laughs> you know, he found himself in a dark hallway in a high rise in a bad neighborhood in the Bronx where if there was gunfire, he was going to get killed. And I just shrugged at him like, hey, you know, you trusted me. <laughs> but he goes down and as a lawyer, it was already in his DNA to be collaborative. And then he applied what he learned from collaborative skills. And he was never argumentative as a lawyer at all. And being highly collaborative and not fighting every negotiation, he made more money than any other associate did. And he made partner faster than anybody else in his firm ever did. And he wasn't combative. And what did that look like? He wouldn't fight every point. Consequently, he made his the deals he came to, which he would have come to in a range anyway, came quicker because it wasn't collaborative. But then... When he stood up and pushed, he had a reputation for pushing only when he was totally justified and not because it's what he always did. And because of that, he made more deals. He made more money for his law firm. He wasn't exciting. He didn't slam his hands on the table. He was just vastly more profitable being collaborative than he was being combative. So I'm curious, why why do you think that is? I mean, because obviously there's going to be a lot of people listening to this podcast that say, look, our whole value proposition for all these years has been that we're going to fight hard 
on behalf of our clients and then we're going to win, right? And there's winners and then there's losers. So why do you believe that this, you know, collaborative approach is, you know, is more successful? What's, what's an example of it as well? Yeah, you're going to make your deals faster. You know, people aren't going to push back and fight you only because you're fighting. There's a neuroscience approach. If I approach you being combative, there's going to be a neurochemical change that's going to cause you to be combative in return. It's why law enforcement officers being trained to shout orders is counterproductive because everybody's IQ drops. When you get into the fight or flight mode, you're dumber and you're more likely to push back, which is going to lengthen the amount of time it's going to take you to the deal that you could have gotten to anyway. Because the other side's going to push back, people are going to dig in, and it's just going to take longer for you to get to your deal. Now, you're going to feel better about it. They're going to feel better about it because they fought hard and they felt like they earned it. And in many cases, we used to say in kidnapping negotiations, when we asked how long it's going to take to get the deal and get the hostage out, we'd say when the other side feels like they've gotten everything they can't, feels like. So if you're a combative trained negotiator, you got to feel like you got to fight for a given period of time. You got to go through phases, but it's actually going to take longer. Now, the collaborative negotiator, the fight's never going to get in there. So we're going to get to the same deal. We're going to get there faster. We're not going to feel like we fought every inch away and drug our, dug our heels in or drug our, put our fingernails in a wall. But it's going to come quicker. So your deal velocity comes faster. Then, consequently, if your relationship is being collaborative, when you do push back, it has integrity to it as opposed to it being a tactic. Your pushback is a tactic. Everybody knows it's a tactic. Okay, we're going to box with each other. We're going to go 15 rounds. But if it's not your tactic, if it's integrity, then the other side goes, wait a minute. There's probably something to this because this guy doesn't have a reputation of pushing back as a general rule. They only push back when there's really something there. So I better listen. And it's a completely different dynamic. Now, it doesn't lengthen the process. What it does is it actually gets the other side of attention more quickly and makes them open to listening to you because you only push back when you got a real point, when it's justified. And so it protects your integrity again. It's not a brawl. The other side actually listens. Yeah. So I recall you saying at one point that when it came to hostage negotiations, the absolute best thing you had to offer someone was jail time. And I'm curious, like, what makes a negotiation more or less difficult and, and how much of it, if any, has to do with what you even have to offer someone? Well, all boils down to a vision of the future and what vision you've got. Is it short term? Is it long term? And where do you think this is taking you long term? I know an extremely successful attorney in Los Angeles that any time he got into an argument with somebody or it became combative. And this guy started with nothing and ended up with a law firm that was successful enough to make him a billionaire. Because I heard what a great negotiator was, I asked him to come speak at a class at a USC. And he looked at me and he says, what do you want me to talk about? And I'm like, look, it's a negotiation class based on your success and your reputation. You could talk about anything. You could read us the dictionary. We're going to learn from it. I don't care what you say. You come in and you talk about whatever you want. He's not really super prepped. He's, he's not, a, he's not a, um, a, an instructor. So he gets into role plays with the students right away. Well, why not role play instead of lecture? And every single time somebody wanted to argue with him, he'd say something to this effect. I want this moment to be something that we look back on 10 years from now and realize this is a moment that was the beginning of a great relationship between the two of us. So that's a vision of the future. He's placed a moment in the future where both sides are in wonderful condition. He never said, well, we split the difference. He never, he never used the term win-win, although effectively you could argue that that's what he was proposing. But what he was was painting a picture, a vision of the future to get us out of the present moment. Now, all we got to do is work our way there, collaborative. So as a hostage negotiator, even though I'm selling jail time, the vision of the future is where you live. I want us to talk about you coming out alive. You live. 
And at some point in time, your life gets reset and you get to start over. Now, what happens between here and there could be bumpy, could be difficult. But here's where I'm going on the future. You're okay. Now the conversation opens up. The other side is a little more collaborative because you're not there for their demise. On that note, I know you mentioned earlier this idea of a win-win deal, which is, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, just law promoters and so on, they like to position a win-win deal. But I've heard you say that if someone comes to you with a win-win deal, your spidey sense goes off and you immediately think, this person's trying to pick my pocket. That hasn't failed me yet. And we would have gotten anybody who likes to use the phrase win win right off the bat, maybe as their opening line. I know uh, privately, you know, we'll get into a conversation and they'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to come in high so I can end up where I wanted to be all along. I don't really split the difference. I just lie about what I want so I can get my way and they don't even know it. I mean, it, it is it's just such a profile. That has yet to fail me. What's an alternative way that someone should position, let's say, a true win-win deal where there's benefits let's say, to both parties, but obviously not using those words, not coming in hot saying like, hey, this is good for you and this is good for me. And what's an alternative way to do this? Well, typically, however you might want to start your conversation should be the way that you end. Because the last impression is the lasting impression. Whatever I say to you last is going to carry us forward to the next conversation. You know, there's so much emphasis placed on a first impression. And I've gone back and forth and back and forth and looked at all the information. And in point of fact, the only thing about a first impression you got to worry about is that you make a bad first impression because then that becomes your last impression because the inside is so fed up with you, they don't want talking. You can get away with a mediocre first impression. The other side is going to give you some rope. You can't get away with a bad first impression. And then immediately... Whatever the last impression is, it colors the rest of the interaction. So how are people doing it wrong? They'll start off by saying, like, I value our relationship. Um, you know, I don't want this to be competitive. I want you to know I want to work something out. That might be their opening statement, their opening phrase, the opening line of an email. And then immediately they'll become combative and they'll start arguing. And they'll start making points. And then the last thing they'll say, I would remind you. We still have other rights and remedies that we can avail ourselves of at any time. Love, Chris. <laughs> that, you know, that ends up a threat. I mean, come on. If you're going to say something negative, it should be up front and you should warn the other side it's coming, whether it's verbal or an email. And then what you said at the beginning, which was genuine, unless you were saying, I want a win-win deal. I know that's a setup. But what did you mean by a win-win deal? Write that out and finish that. That's the real difference. If you say you want a win-win deal, you start out by telling me what that looks like. If that looks like the only way I win is I do all the work and you reap all the benefits, which is every time I've come across it, that's what it means. Yep. Don't pull my leg here. You know, don't deceive by omission. Don't leave out the material facts that will affect everything. You get a lot more far farther when people view your words with integrity as opposed to people viewing all your words as tactics. Now, when it comes to the power of generosity, which I've heard you mention more and more recently, especially when it comes to negotiating, like in what ways can generosity be perceived as a, let's say, a strategic advantage? I'm going to be appreciative of your generosity. That's a critical issue of empathy. What I might view as you being stingy, you might view as being generous. There's a pretty good chance that most people start making concessions before they get to the table. Almost everybody does. So to some degree, you view your opening approach as being generous. And empathy, again, that fine line here is it's not about my perspective. It's about yours. It's not about whether it's an accurate or fair perspective. It's about your perspective. And there's a pretty good chance that you think that you've already made a concession. And you probably have as a human being, because as a general rule, we start making concessions before we ever get to the table because we're afraid to find out. You know, you get you get together with people on your side. Somebody says, I can't say that. That's a non-starter. So you decide not to go with it. Well, you just started negotiating against yourself. And most of the B-level negotiators and below are going to do that on a regular basis instead of having the courage to find out. So 
my appreciation of generos- generosity on your part, when you really feel it, is going to encourage it. And for me, I'm trying to encourage something, and to you, I'm simply being appreciative. So generosity is a critical element of the DNA component, but it's not the only component and it's not the most driving component. I want to be aware of it. I also want to be aware of it. It's not the biggest component. You know, it's a little bit like the molecule for water, H2O. There's twice as much hydrogen as there is oxygen. Both are essential, but there is twice as much hydrogen. So there's twice as much negativity as there is positivity. And me ignoring either element is going to make an incomplete deal and it's going to miss the mark. I'm not going to get as much as I possibly can. So being aware of what generosity is and what it really looks like to you is critical on my part. So when it comes to how people make decisions, I mean, generally from what I've read, my experience, correct me if I'm wrong, that the reason why we believe what we believe is typically the summation of the information we consume and the personal experiences we've had. And the expression that generally people don't pick a side out of thinking, they pick a side out of feeling. So how do you navigate various subconscious biases and, and different perceptions when, when you're in a negotiation? Well, simply being aware of it for two reasons, because then if, if that's true and it is, then my conclusions are based on incomplete information and so are yours. And we can both think we're completely right. And intellectually, it's an imperfect world. No matter what, it's an imperfect world. I'm having a conversation with Daniel Pink not that long ago, and he says, look, I'm a flawed human being making difficult decisions in a complicated world with imperfect information. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's exactly the summary. So being aware that the other side might have a better idea and then being aware that if you get the right pieces of information across to the other side, you might enlighten them which is another reason to not be combative. Because if you're combative, they're not going to be enlightened. When somebody's combative, their IQ goes down. There's no two ways around that. You're 31% smarter in a positive frame of mind, and nobody's in a positive frame of mind when they're combative. Your survival mechanisms have been triggered. Your fight mode has been triggered. You're dumber. The kicker on that is there's a lot of self-righteousness involved. So not only are you dumber, but you're even more convinced that you're right than you were before. So if I'm going to enlighten you, the chances of me doing it by attacking you are just about zero. So I want to enlighten you. I want to share with you pieces of information that will change your mind because I've got them. And conversely, vice versa, you got them too. So it's really us getting into a conversation where we can share the information more quickly and come to an outcome more quickly. Yeah. I know you speak a lot on tactical empathy. I recall that, you know, I think even in, in the most recent book, you mentioned like Daniel Goldman who wrote a book called Focus. And in there, there's the empathy triad. And he talks about the different types of empathies, like cognitive, emotional, empathic, you know, concern. Cognitive empathy, you mentioned, is the first cousin of tactical empathy. And I'm just curious, how would you define it? And then I've got a great follow-up because you also mentioned that the best people at this tend to be sociopaths. Yeah, how kind of intuitive is that, right? Yeah, it's a really close cousin, cognitive empathy. And, you know, what Goldman doesn't really point out really, really well is cognitive empathy is about an accurate reading of the other side. And the reasons why sociopaths are best at it is because they don't get in their own way. They don't think about how you should feel or how you should react. I'll ask somebody, all right, so how does the other side see this? And they'll go, this is how they should see it, which means that ain't how I see it. It's how they actually see it. And your sense of right and wrong, you know, your sense of justice, your moral compass is going to get in your way of recognizing how the other side sees it. It's a little bit like the Israeli-Palestinian thing. Each side is going to get their feelings about the injustices that they've suffered is going to get in their way of seeing how the other side actually sees it. And so it's going to color their conversation. So cognitive empathy, you know, theoretically, a sociopath, their moral compass is not there. They got all the same emotions. They don't have guilt and they probably don't have a moral compass, which means the stuff that gets in their way of seeing what your reaction actually is, is not there. They're free to make a clear read of you. And because of that, they often make extremely accurate reads. 
the difference between cognitive and tactical empathy is I'm going to say it out loud. Instead of me just reading you accurately, I'm going to articulate what that read is. And then it's going to be guided by what we know to be true from neuroscience, which even though this is a neuroscientifically uh, accurate, it's, you know, an application, it's neuroscientists aren't going to disagree with me. You're 75% negative. Everybody's, everybody's survival thinking is 75% negative. Now, where it rests and what organs in the brain, the amygdala, I'm listening to a fascinating conversation on Huberman right now where the neuroscientist psychologist that he's having a conversation with is talking about how the amygdala is not all fear centered. You know, we look at the amygdala as being like where all our fears and our reptilian brain are survival reactions are based and she's saying like yeah that's mostly true but not entirely but then at the end of the day in terms of application she says we're still principally negative because that's how we survived predatory threat what could kill you you've got to react to it and get away from it the caveman right now or you're dead in terms of you know the positive stuff which are procreation and eating kind of depends upon how long it's been since you've eaten day or two since you've eaten, you're going to want to eat before you have sex. If you got a full belly, you're probably going to want to procreate. But in any instance, if there's a saber-toothed tiger there, you don't get away right now, you're dead. We've inherited that wire. No matter how it's composed in a brain, we're mostly negative. Tactical empathy takes that into account, and we've learned what buttons to push to deactivate your negativity to put you in a much more collaborative frame of mind. I'm curious, like, I don't know if you've ever had this thought, but what would a world look like where everybody practices tactical empathy? Would we still have the same degree of conflict? Is it just in our nature, right, to, to some extent? But, or would that be diminished significantly? Well, if I, if I could wave a magic wand, imagine a world that's highly positive and highly collaborative. Everybody, everybody's borderline, borderline flow state on a regular basis. And we're creating great stuff. Another book I read recently, you know, uh, Walter Isaacson's book about Musk. And how he's driving people to create things that mankind has never seen. And it's burning them out. Well, it, you, everybody be doing it and we wouldn't be getting burned out. What Tesla's done is extraordinary. You know, what Starlink has done, what SpaceX has done. I mean, it's almost incomprehensible. The stuff that we're now taking for granted. Every car company is putting out electric vehicles now because of Musk. And when he got into the industry, every car company had given up on electric vehicles. But he takes his people and he demands beyond performance and beyond excellence. And they create extraordinary things. Yep. But only his company. Everybody would be doing that if we, can, if we can get into a highly collaborative mindset where instead of getting burned out by it, we were energized by it. And we felt better and we couldn't get enough of it. The whole world would be doing it. It will never happen because sure. we're wired the way we are. We'd colonize beyond Mars by now if we were all doing that. So I'm curious, maybe this is like somewhat of a deeper question, but what prevents people from you know, adopting tactical empathy? Meaning that I'm sure you see in the news, whether there's some war going on and like, you have to think these aren't stupid people, right? Like at least the leaders of these organizations, there's some, you know, based on level of intelligence experience and so on that they have to understand the cycle of violence, you know, where that goes. And yet, you know, do you ever wonder how could you get involved and say, this is how we could resolve this, right? What, what, what prevents someone from adopting this level of tactical empathy? Is it ego? Is it other, you know, other, you know, political pressures? Like, why are these things going on for years and years? Yeah. Well, first of all, have you ever seen it or how exposed to it have you been? Have you ever been, have you ever been exposed to a success and known what was the success? You know, like I said before, tactical empathy is astonishing. The practitioners are going to know what happened, but the people that observed it or were involved in it aren't. They're not going to have any idea that's what it was until somebody clued them in on it. This is emotional intelligence. And in many cases, at what point in time do you adopt it? I'm hearing now um, about some extremely successful, world-renowned human beings that are aware of never split the difference and are talking about it. Now, their history is not of having been collaborative. And one person in particular has been described in very visible ways as 
his bite is w- way worse than his bark. Because well, he's got a reputation for kicking people's ass. And having gone through that now, he's like, yeah, this emotional intelligence stuff, this is what I'm into. So nobody knows that. Or what was the journey that got him there? Because he's got a history of being highly successful by being highly combative. So if you don't know, you're looking around for examples. You see this guy who's ridiculously wealthy. And you think of him as a combative guy. You want his money. So let me emulate what I know about him publicly. When he may not be in that game at all. And I think that's one of the issues. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you're rewarded for that behavior, then there's really not much impetus to, to change said behavior. But if obviously if it's not working, you're thinking, okay, maybe there's a different approach. There's not as many people that say maybe there's a better approach as opposed to saying that this isn't working. I need to do something different. The truly ambitious, when especially experienced, ambitious and experienced, when they, I'm finding on a regular basis when they run across, never split the difference in tactical empathy, the light bulb goes on instantly. I mean, instantly. I mean, and you can see behind me the book, The Full Fee Agent. We're putting on a real estate conference in LA in a couple of weeks. And I've been doing joint, joint coaching with Steve Shaw, former uh, NFL player. He was a, a Super Bowl captain on a losing team, but they made the Super Bowl and he was a captain. And so we're, we're doing a webinar just a couple of weeks ago. His top people who are art disciples of tactical empathy and in particular proof of life methodology. Now, when Steve started coaching them, they were making tons of money before one of them is a top real estate broker in San Francisco. And she had no shortage of money and success before she was exposed to the methodology. But because she was ambitious and always looking for better ways to do something, as soon as she came across it, she went like, oh my God, yeah, this is the answer to the riddles that I've been struggling with that I just thought went with the territory, but yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. And to some degree, it may require a journey to get to the point where you suddenly are given an answer to a question that you've been asking deep down inside you didn't even know you were asking. Yeah, I guess true learning is not gaining new information. It's it's changing your behavior and that's not easy. I mean, with what we were talking about even before the uh, before we started recording the podcast of just like how difficult it is to adopt certain habits and the level of consistency, it's different skill sets, there's a lot of psychology behind it. I wanted to ask you, you know, coming back to negotiations in this digital age, right? Let's say a negotiation taking place digitally or written form. Maybe you're going back and forth with someone through an email or a text or talking to them on the phone, like you're not seeing them in person. What changes there? Like, it, you know, how, how can people be better when they're not like looking at someone directly? Each um, a mode of communication is being complimentary, not your own, your soul mode. And then don't be lazy. And what do I mean by that? People are going to want to put seven things in an email. They're going to want to put seven things in a text. A great conversation is where you say one thing, you communicate one thing, and you wait for it to land. And then you wait for the reaction from the other side. If you chunk your emails and your text messages down that way. Most people don't. Most people only want to text. Most people only want to email. They only want to send one text. They only want to send one email. You know, they thought a long time about an email. They're thinking about it for three or four days. And three or four days where the thought goes into a single email. Or maybe, I think what everybody's guilty of, myself included, when you reach your epiphany moment, You just want to share the epiphany and you forget about how long it took you to get there or thinking journey you were on. And because it's now so clear to you that you expect it to be crystal clear when you communicate it as such. I find that to be a shortcoming of me leading an organization. Communicate, you know, the outcome of the equation. And assuming, not realizing what kind of a thinking journey I went to get to that moment, and then not wanting to allow the other people to go on the same thinking journey. I think those are some of the issues, trying to communicate too much at once. And then also, you talked about the pandemic. The real struggle today is getting people to come back to work. Black Swan Group was almost all virtual before the pandemic. 
And now I'm trying to get us in person as much as possible. I'm hiring people to work with me in person because the in-person time is irreplaceable. I mean, you need it some. It doesn't have to be all your time, but it needs to be some of it because there's something special about being in person with somebody. Yeah, I'm in agreement. And, you know, what's interesting is that we've never been more connected, you know, let's say from a, from a digital standpoint. And yet one would argue that the relationship, the depth of new relationships has never been more, more shallow. Right. And I think it's because to your point, being lazy, it, it's much easier to, I mean, sometimes you don't even need to send a text. You can just like the message, right? You don't, you don't even have to say anything. And obviously if you're looking at like growing an organization, trying to build a culture, at least, at least from my experience, my perspective, um, I could be wrong, but I've just found that there's something to be said about having that level of cohesion in person that you just, it's very difficult, if not impossible to replicate virtually. And I'm not talking about virtual happy hours and we meet up once a year. I hear it all the time from my, you know, my friends that run virtual companies, don't get me wrong, but they have, you know, team members that graduated from college to work out of their apartments. And it's just odd to me. And yeah, and it's not best for everybody, you know, and, and you as a leader, I mean, you, you got insights to communicate. That's just not going to happen digitally, even in a Zoom call. Because a Zoom call, everybody's got to be sitting together. It's got to be at the, at the same time. It, it's not spontaneous. You got to look at your computer. And, you know, every, every now and then, the people that I have that I see when we're all in Vegas at the same time, I'll be getting up to get a cup of coffee. And I'll say, hey, look, you know, let me explain this wacky thought that I just shared with you a few minutes ago. And that never would happen if I, if I can find it, even to Zoom, which is simultaneous, but it's still, it's not spontaneous. That's right. That's right. I know you mentioned that you've got this habit of like small stakes practice for high stakes results. If you could speak to that of what, you know, what it looks like for someone to get ready for negotiations, what it's like to hone this skill or any examples that you have. Yeah. Well, so negotiation is a perishable skill. There's no way around it. Jim Camp, uh, who was a friend and a colleague, collaborator, wrote a book in 2002 called Slow With No. And having been a coach, he called negotiation a human performance event. And it is. Which means simply doing it is not enough to stay good at it. You know, Tiger Woods spent more time on a practice courses than he ever did in tournaments. If the only thing that Tiger Woods when he was at the top of his game, dominating the world. If he only played in tournaments, we wouldn't know who he was. He, he was famous for being coachable. He was famous for the massive amount of time he spent practicing. He even changed his swing. At the height of his game, he changed his swing. That's how coachable he was. So he's always getting into small stakes practice. You know, what does that mean for a human being? I got to have a conversation with a lift driver. You know, I got I got to throw something out with a Starbucks person. You know, I got to do my cold reads. I got to try to read the emotions. I don't say how are you today to anybody ever. Right. I read how I think they are, and I go, "Looks like you're having a tough day," or it "Looks like you're enjoying yourself today." Whatever the read actually is, and your read doesn't even have to be accurate. When I'm traveling all the time, I'll throw a read on the guys in TSA, and I'm rolling through TSA one day. And I realize I haven't thrown a read on any of the guys. And so as I'm waiting for my bag to come out, there's a guy standing there. And he's got kind of, you know, just an indifferent look on his face. And I go, tough day? Now, that was an inaccurate read. It just happens to be one of my go-to reads with TSA. Because <laughs> it's almost always a tough day for them. And he gets this confused look on his face. Like, no. I adapt. And I go, just another day. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah just another day. Now, 10 minutes later, I'm in the middle of a negotiation that I did not plan. I'm sitting in a business class lounge. The phone rings and it's somebody I got to talk to because it's hell getting them on the phone. And I was successful because I loosened up my negotiation muscles with the TSA guy 10 minutes earlier. And I was still loose. And when that call came in and I got to where I wanted to go collaboratively with the guy, I remember thinking, thank God I threw that readout on the TSA guy a little bit ago because now I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm loosened up. I'm ready to go into the game. So you're Tiger Woods or you never know when that call is going to come in and you got to be loose when you suddenly tapped on the shoulder to go into the game. Right. So would you say somebody that 
let's say they've been in a number of negotiations and they've been doing negotiations for years. Is there any correlation between that and them being a good negotiator? It depends upon how introspective they were on the negotiations. Did they learn everywhere along the way? Did they think about it in between? It's going to sound like I'm bad mouthing some people, but I'm going to compare Patrick Mahomes with Kirk Cousins. And I'm watching a Netflix show, Quarterbacks. Great show. Yep. Anyway, you know, they're comparing them and, and um, the other guy. The reason why I'm having trouble remembering his name <clears throat> is because he's he's struggling. I think he's a wine. He's like the only Samoan. Oh, uh, yeah, oh yes. City. Well, you, it, it's Marcus Mariota. He must have the yeah. world's best agent who got him on that show somehow. With yeah, Patrick Mahomes yeah, yeah. and Kirk Cousins. Great example. You know, uh, and it's a good contrast. So Cousins perfectionist. What's wrong with being a perfectionist? First of all, if you have a great game, the next game you have is probably going to be lousy because you had a great game and you you reach your goal and you relax and you drop your guard. Number one. Number two, you're off. When you're not perfect, you're very hard on yourself. Negative frame of mind. And Cousins is a very successful quarterback, by the way. Plenty of teams should have Cousins at the helm because he does win games. You know, there's no way around the fact that Kirk Cousins is a winner. Now, how many Super Bowls does he have? In, in the same episode, one of the episodes, they're, they're walking through his trophy room at home, you know, the I Love Me room, which everybody's entitled to. There's nothing wrong with that. You need to have a room that makes you feel good, reminds you who you are. And he pulls down the scouting report from high school and he reads the scouting report from him as a quarterback. And he looks at the camera and says, yeah, this is pretty much me today. What does that mean? Kind of admit he hasn't grown that much. Now, Mahomes... He's delighted with the game. I mean, he's having a ball. He's nothing but creativity. And if he has a great game, in an upbeat sense, he's like, yeah, you know, okay, so it was a great game, but I could have done this and I could have done that. And he's talking about it. He's not down on himself. But this is much borderline flow state where he's delighting and exceeding himself Every step of the way. And he's throwing sidearm, he's throwing underarm, he's throwing behind the back. He's doing stuff that nobody ever had seen before. And if you didn't understand the difference between ambition and perfection, cousins of perfectionists and largely unhappy and not winning Super Bowls. Mahomes is ambitious and delighted and having the best time. And God knows how many rings he's going to have by the time this guy gets done. Until you really understand the contrast. How do you get better? You can't be a perfectionist. It's like, it's really looking at, I mean, you mentioned that show. It's like, how does someone handle losing or how does someone handle something not going their way? And I think that tells you a lot about someone. It would have been interesting to have the quarterback show for this season with the Chiefs, right? Because they were struggling, you know, in the kind of the early middle part of the season. And I think obviously they turned it around and won a Super Bowl. But it's just fascinating to see that when someone's winning, it doesn't really tell you a whole lot about someone, just in general. Just the same way where if we're talking about negotiations, if someone has had great outcomes, they may believe that they're right. And as a result, they can believe they're going to be right all the time. It creates this hubris or false sense of, you know, of confidence. What are your thoughts though, in terms of like, you know, what is the correct way to respond when something doesn't go your way a negotiation doesn't go your way? Like, you know, any, anything in the business. First of all, just because it could have done it better, doesn't mean it would have changed the outcome. That was very definitely my uh, approach to Hostile to your issues. See, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this, by the way. This is timely because last night my wife and I were watching Beckham, also on Netflix. I don't know if you watched that show. And they talk about the time where like, I believe like England is playing, uh, I believe it was Spain. And Beckham gets a yellow card, then he gets a red card, then he's out of the game. This is like a major World Cup event and everybody just dogs Beckham saying like, how could you do this? We lost because of you. This is our chance, this is our opportunity. And then they mentioned, and by the way, yes, he did get a red card. He was out for the game. But they didn't lose at that point. They lost on the penalty kicks, right? So, and what's to say that if, you know, if he stayed in the game that they would have won? Right. Yeah, exactly. How do you look at it? Are you always looking to get better? Win or lose, are you always looking to get better? I came to learn what it meant, best chance of success. Have I, have I got the best system? Right. Now, unfortunately, the only time you really question whether or not you got the best system is when you lose or you lose badly. And most human beings, that's the only time they're really digging down on what we could have done better. When you're rocking and rolling and you're winning, you're not, uh, most of the time, you're not 100% sure what you could have done better because the outcome was a victory. And you'd be like, ah, you know, all right, so, you know, I won. Let's celebrate. Let's be happy. And so 
by and large, you don't mostly put that deep of analysis in it unless not only you lost, but if you lost big. I didn't really think about our system in hostage negotiation until I had a really big loss, a really ugly case that several Americans and a bunch of Filipinos got killed. And as I'm sitting back there thinking about it, I realized that my boss always said best chance of success, which means by definition, there's no guarantee of success. You're going to lose some. And then for me personally, it was, all right, so can we get better? Got to get better. Got to figure out a way to get better. And of course, that's a problem with winning. You don't put that sort of introspective on, on the win. When you should, but you don't. What do you think happens? I mean, this is somewhat of a philosophical discussion of maintaining a competitive edge, I think, is one of the most difficult things, if not impossible, over the longer, you know, the longer the period, the more difficult it gets, right? There's like gaining a competitive advantage and then maintaining said advantage. Now, obviously, we were talking about the Chiefs. They've won several Super Bowls before that was the Patriots. They had their dynasty. You know, they've got the University of Alabama. You can look at, you know, even great organizations that, that thrive for many years because nothing is forever. It, it, I don't know that any organization or any person has maintained a competitive advantage forever right? Or for the entire time that they were playing whatever game that they were playing. What do you think happens when you maintain this competitive advantage for so many years and then things drop? What, what is that? First of all, there's a big difference between whether you're competitive or whether you're ambitious. And competitive is you're measuring yourself against your competition. Right. As opposed to yourself. And this has been something you know, I've been thinking about, talking about with the, the people in my company a lot lately. And I think you need both. Um, because you're going to start to fall short at some point in time. You're going to get complacent and you're not going to notice it if you're beating everybody. And then when you get beat, suddenly you wake up. It's a bit of a cliche. Uh, I think that guy that broke the four minute mile might've been Roger Bannister, but whoever first broke the four minute mile, then suddenly in the next year, like four or five more people just broke it. And my view is they needed to get beaten by somebody they thought they were better than. They needed a good slap in the face because they were only competitive. And you need to get beaten every now and then to remind you that, you know, you got complacent. You got lazy, you got fat, you got drunk on your success because you're only measuring yourself against your competition. Now, when you're ambitious, you're measuring yourself against yourself and you're always looking to get better. You're always looking for a little bit of a homes. Now, in organizations, what happens? By and large, I think the team erodes. You know, uh, the Patriots, the coaches, their assistant coaches that are, you know, uh, doing a Patriot way with Belichick, you know, they're getting head coaching jobs other places. They got a turnover on the team. Yep. And they're not as diligent on training and bring along the members of the team as he will when he first built the team. You know, that's kind of my hypothesis. What I find most interesting about the Chiefs the most dangerous about them is until they lose people in the organization, because they gave Mahomes a max contract, which is almost a guarantee of the demise of the organization. Seahawks give Russell Wilson a max contract, and they can't afford to pay anybody else. They don't replace the players, and suddenly the Seahawks are on a downward spiral. They're downward spiral. They haven't pulled themselves out. Or the last Super Bowl, the Ravens won. They they give the quarterback a max contract. And they can't hold the team together. And it's the demise of the organization and the quarterback. They give Mahomes a max contract, and these guys turn around and pull things back together. So that means they got a great organization. They got a GM and a general management team that, that's finding players who are coachable. And they got a coaching staff from end to end that's bringing out the best in the players and they're putting winning teams on the field. Having undergone massive ros roster changes, because they can't afford the superstars that they had when they first won, but they maxed Mahomes' contract out. So as we're talking about it now, it's did you maintain the team, the integrity of the team end to end, the level of players? And when you lost people, they went on to bigger and better things. How good were you at replacing? Yeah. This is why I think, you know, business is the, is the ultimate sport. I love it because there's, I mean, there's no off season, right? You're going up against, you know, in the case of, you know, other organizations, if you have competition about people who are also very ambitious, right? I mean, they are very intelligent, they're very creative. And in the end, I think that can also drive the best entrepreneurs, right? When you have that in an industry, I think it's very good for, for everyone, right? I mean, it's just because I mean, if it was too easy, right, then at some point you would get complacent. Um, the goal, I think, is to avoid that. 
the thing that I always worry about is that, you know, do you have to be endlessly paranoid, right? To never become complacent? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and I got to tell you something, man. I mean, studying your methodology and learning from you about how you, you run and crisp in the organization and how you're building a team and where you came from. I mean, I will very unashamedly offer that we know more about negotiation than anybody else does. And it's only one component in the DNA molecule and building teams, and building an organization. We are studying the hell out of what you are doing and picking up everything we possibly can and emulating it because it's impressive. I talk about you and your organization all the time. Well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Always learning. I mean, that's been my experience. Never, you know, you never stop learning. And if it looks easy, this is what I've learned to respect other organizations or even like we're talking about the chiefs. Whenever they make it look easy, I have so much respect for that because you know that it's not. Because you know internally that if the fact that someone's making something look easy or simple means that they have done so much internally that they, they have a level of, I hesitate to say mastery, but just like a level of you know, depth and preparation that makes it look simple. So yeah, agree. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. So that's right. Oh, thank you. That that was my goal. I just wanted to get a that's right out of the whole the podcast. So Chris, as we come to a close, I know you answered this back in 2020. I don't know if your answer has changed, but this being the game changing attorney podcast, what does being a game changer mean to you? Yeah, really plowing new ground. I realized that when I was in the FBI, we were plowing new ground on a regular basis. There's tremendous amount of freedom there. Uh, there are fewer people that are criticizing you and naysayers because you're out new ground. They can't say you're breaking the rules because you're out someplace where there was no rules that have been established. You know, there's no status quo. And to me, the one thing that that we're constantly doing and, and we're believing is, is we're plowing new ground and emulating the people who's envy in a good way, like I envy the success and growth of your organization. You know, what can we learn from that? And then what can we add to it to plow new ground? Like the world's problems are not going to be solved by governments ever. They're going to be solved by businesses. So how do we plow new ground and have a positive impact in new ways on everything in the world where people want to do well and collaborate? And to me, it's a lot of fun. And changing a game is plowing new ground. I want to give a huge thank you to Chris Voss for taking the time to join us again on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. If you found this episode valuable, here are three free ways that I can help you grow your law firm. Number one, download the first chapter of my book absolutely free at GameChangingAttorney.com. Number two, you can shoot me a text at 404-531-7691 and I'll answer any question that you've got for me. And finally, number three, if you can leave this podcast a five-star review, it'll help us gain access to more influential thought leaders and bring their lessons learned here to you. For more information on our interview with Chris Voss, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit legalpodcast.com.